around the world, paramedics are getting called to people's homes for chest pain calls millions of times a year. And what's important to make sure that we identify is that there is more than one chest pain emergency that we need to be aware of. And that's why we're gonna be making sure that we know the five other deadly chest pain calls we can go on other than a myocardial infarction so we don't miss those because again those are the ones that can get really tricky and if we identify them we can treat them appropriately so our patients have the best outcomes possible key to this in particular identifying this is to use your assessment to differentiate the different emergencies and that's what we're going to be talking about today today is using your differentials using your history and your assessment to identify subtle differences in things like a aortic rupture or an esophageal rupture a pericarditis. Those are the types of things that we're going to look at today to see where we can see the subtle differences. That way we can identify them early and start treating them early. And so what I said there was about pain and by chest pain in particular, it can mean a world of different things. Now we know that myocardial infarctions classically come up as this squeezing, tightening, you know, crushing types of pain, but that's quite descriptive to an ischemic injury in the heart itself, which is very kind of closely tied to a myocardial infarction. But when it comes to other types of chest pain emergencies, we have things like aortic dissection that really more comes up as a more of a tearing pain. A sudden tearing pain, ripping pains. That's the typical thing that we kind of identify when it comes to aortic dissections. And then we have things like pericarditis. That's more of a dull ache. Okay, dull ache and sometimes even kind of a burn. Then we have things like the esophageal tears that are more like epigastric. Okay, or it can come up as more neck pain because of the location itself, uh, depending on where that esophageal tear comes from. But again, it's still in that mediastinum, it's still in that chest region, so we need to be aware of it. And then pulmonary embolisms, uh, things like pain, but it's more pleuretic. Okay? And that pleuretic pain is something that we need to look out for. And then tension pneumos, it is pleuratic as well. And so there's a lot of different description words that we should be looking for here in order to maybe subtly push us in the direction of, maybe this is not a myocardial infarction, I have a high index of suspicion that it might be one of these other cardiac emergencies that we need to be aware of. So let's look at these in depth and see where we can see those differences. Other than just the pain, there are some signs and symptoms and some assessment techniques that we can look at in order to quickly identify differences between this, a myocardial infarction, and these chest pain emergencies. Okay, so now we're gonna go into these emergencies and look them at them individually to make sure that we can see these subtle differences and identify these subtle differences between them and myocardial infarction. So that way we can make better diagnosis or at least keep a higher index of suspicion on other cardiac emergencies than other than myocardial infarction. So when it comes to aortic dissections, the pain is quite different like we just talked about. And this pain is gonna be more of a tearing pain. Okay, a sharp tearing pain. That's gonna be a pretty common symptom that we're gonna see with aortic dissections. And it's all due to a tear in the aortic intima, which is the inner lining. Okay, you have your lumen here, and then you have a, the tunica intima, which is the innermost lining against the lumen. And that tears and it ruptures. And it can tear anywhere from within the aorta itself, this ascending aorta from its branches, and also the descending aorta as well. It can happen any one of those places. But again, the pain description is going to be quite similar in that tearing pain. It is less common in ACS, but has a high mortality rate and it's con treated completely different than a myocardial infarction which is why it's important for us to identify it and have a high index of suspicion when we start to hear symptoms like tearing pain 
as opposed to crushing and squeezing types of pains. It should lead us down a different path or at least keep our eyes open for the potential of that. And another thing too that potentially could happen is that this pain could migrate. And so as this rip gets further, as this tear gets further and damages more and starts to migrate and continually rip further and more and more tissue and create what we call a false lumen, where more blood is now starting to get inside between the tunica intima and tunica uh, media, the actual muscle layer, then we start to see this area tear and tear and tear even more and that pain can move and shift. So a good question to ask in this situation is where's the pain? Where did it start? And they go right here. Now, where does it feel like it's right now? And they say, you know, it's more down here. So it's migrated. That is a pretty common symptom or a more common symptom in aortic dissections than they are in myocardial infarction. So again, keeping your eye out for that is a good thing to ask uh, to your patients to make sure you don't miss that as well. About 70% have abnormal ECGs and they may mimic ACS. Now, when it comes to ACS and what's affected, typically the right coronary artery is going to be most affected in an aortic dissection. And so seeing ECG changes such as an inferior MI is your most common finding on an ECG uh, due to the right coronary artery being the most affected. Another big symptom that's often talked about is differences in blood pressure on the right and the left arm. Now, depending on where this tear is, sometimes these tears happen here, right here on the kind of where we have the branching of the other vessels that are going to the arms or going to the carotid arteries and so on and so forth. If the tear happens here where we have okay pressure maybe in this vessel that's branching off to the, the, the right arm, but over on this vessel here we have poor pressures because of this tear that's happening here, then we might see a differences or discrepancies in between the left and the right arm. However, if the tear, if this dissection happened after the branches of those vessels off the aorta, we may not see that discrepancy is all between the left and the right. And especially if we had the tear in the descending aorta, we wouldn't see any differences in the upper, between both the left and the right arm but we may see a higher blood pressure in the upper extremities and a lower blood pressure in the lower extremities if this, uh, if this tear or dissection is within the descending aorta, simply because we would have more volume and more systemic vascular resistance in the upper, um, in the upper extremities and those upper areas as opposed to the lower extremities because of where that tear is. Now, pericarditis is often described as a dull, okay, dull or burning pain. Okay, because of the origin, because of the pathology, we see the description of pain is quite different than we see in a myocardial infarction. Another interesting thing about pericarditis is the fact that we actually start to see differences in that pain depending on the position of the patient. So if the patient is leaning back, meaning that the heart is actually leaning more posteriorly, we actually see that they have more pain because of the less space in the posterior chambers and the areas where the heart sits. As they move forward, as they lean forward, they actually have a reduction of pain as the heart moves anteriorly because there's more room for that expansion and contraction of the heart, which means there's less friction against the heart in those positions. So that's a good assessment technique that you can into in order to determine that maybe this patient is actually having a pericarditis as opposed to a myocardial infarction, trying to see if you can change the quality of pain by moving them, leaning them forward and leaning them back to see if maybe there's a change there, could again lead you towards a pericarditis. ECG changes are quite a bit different in the myocardial infarction than they are pericarditis. Biggest things that we're looking for for pericarditis is PR depression, and PR depression globally through the entire ECG is suggestive of a pericarditis as well. Now, pericarditis, for the most part, are not life-threatening unless we start to see an accumulation of fluid because we know this pericardium if it has an accumulation of fluid or what we call a pericardial effusion 
If that effusion gets big enough, it could create a cardiac tamponade, which is ultimately too much pressure in the pericardial sac that's putting pressure on the ventricles and the myocytes of the heart, not allowing them to expand and contract like they normally would in order to push blood and move blood forward. So that is the danger of pericarditis, is it could turn into a large pericardial effusion and ultimately a pericardial tamponade. Now esophageal ruptures, now because they are, because of the location of the esophagus itself, this is why it's added in here because again, it can create chest pain. And But the biggest thing with the, the chest pain that they're going to see is typically going to be a very different in nature. It's going to be a tearing again, tearing or burning pain because of the the contents that are ultimately in the esophagus itself and so that's really what we're going to see when it comes to an esophageal tear now what's different about the esophagus is actually that it is missing a layer that the rest of the gi typically has now in the gi we typically have the mucosal layer where most of the mucus is it's the innermost layer of the lumen then we have the muscular layer that allows for peristalsis and movement of food but we usually have a serosal layer which is a hard layer on the outside that the actual the esophagus actually lacks and that's why that they're more prone to tears and ruptures is because it's missing that large piece of protection that we need and in fact the main reason we're starting to see increases in esophageal tears and ruptures is the use of scopes and different types of procedures that are now using the esophagus as a passageway to look into the GI tract and as we see more and more of those procedures occur the more more likely that esophageal tears are going to go up and we're going to see this continually on the rise as we do more of these procedures and so these types of injuries are definitely something that we could see more often coming pretty soon here now as far as the symptoms go it's really going to depend on the location of this tear because we could see tears anywhere along the esophagus itself so they could be describing more neck pain or epigastric pain again it really depends on where that tear is is where they're going to basically be able to point out exactly where that tear is and it's just going to depend on where that trauma particularly is other things that you may see with esophageal tears and ruptures especially is some symptoms of sepsis as well because again we're spilling contents that are not supposed to be in those areas which is something that we need to be looking out for other things that you can look for in this particular patient is actually subcutaneous emphysema around the neck and may and even have pain radiating to back and depending on where this tear again or rupture is we could see a radiation to the back but again a common sign is subcutaneous emphysema. Now pulmonary embolisms are a pretty common call in the emergent setting that also have a, a symptom of chest pain. But this chest pain is a little bit different than a myocardial infarction, um, or at least sometimes it is. It is often more of a pleuretic Okay, or pleuretic pain and this pleuretic pain is essentially going to be more located in the pleura area as opposed to the menisthenum. now that is just a generalization of pulmonary embolisms it doesn't always have to happen like that and sometimes the pain is so non-descriptive in pulmonary embolisms it's almost useless as an assessment tool and we need to dig a little bit further into that pain our assessment and the history of the patient to determine maybe if this is a pulmonary embolism we should be treating this differently and so that's what we're going to be looking at here for a pulmonary embolism. Now 80% of these clots happen, these clots in pulmonary embolisms that land inside this pulmonary tissue are due to DVTs. Okay, deep vein thrombuses. So 80% of them happen because of a thrombus that occurs in typically a, one of the legs and then that breaks off and creates an embolus in the lungs and ultimately is going to shut off or block flow of blood to the area that that blood that clot is now clot or blocking and so that means that we have less blood flow we have less ventilation in that area ultimately creating our ventilation perfusion mismatch in the affected area there so those are the things that we're going to be looking for in order to determine a pulmonary embolism so if they have pleuretic pain or they're describing some they have a alter level of consciousness maybe it's due to hypoxia which would make sense given the pathology going on here they're talking about pleuretic pain or maybe their history is saying that they were immobile for the last six to eight hours because they went on a long drive 
That's a common finding in the history of these patients when they have long drives where they've been immobile for so long, DVTs can start to develop in those situations for sure. Same with patients had recent surgeries and they've been immobile because of their surgery. All those types of situations where they have a lack of mobility, that, that increases the chances of DVTs. And so if you have that history and you're thinking about a possible uh, possible pulmonary embolism, start looking for DVTs or signs of DVTs like swelling, redness, pain on palpation in the lower extremities to identify a possible DVT in that area, which again raises the suspicion that this is a pulmonary embolism, not a myocardial infarction, which is often misdiagnosed as. Another big thing that you can look at for pulmonary embolisms is their end tidal CO2. Now, end tidal CO2, the reason being is because we have that ventilation perfusion mismatch, we actually have a trapping of CO2. But so you actually have a POP CO2 that's uh, relatively high. It means that we actually are not able to excrete that CO2. So it stays in the blood longer and accumulates within the blood. So if you actually get blood work back, maybe in an intra-facility transfer, and you notice that the PCO2 is quite high, but you put them on a nasal cannula end tidal CO2 and you notice the end tidal CO2 is low, that discorrelation could be a very good indicator that we have a ventilation perfusion mismatch and indicate that we have a pulmonary embolism because of the accumulating CO2. Now that's not the only reason we accumulate CO2, but the discorrelation between the two gives us a pretty good indicator and a pretty good high index of suspicion that a pulmonary embolism is occurring and not a myocardial infarction. So another thing you can look for again in order to again and confirm your suspicions if you're thinking that this is not a myocardial infarction. So the last one we're going to talk about is a pneumothorax. So this is when air accumulates in the pleural space. And so we have a pleural space here like so, and air is going to start to accumulate in this particular area. There's a few reasons that this occurs. Most of them are due to trauma, but they can also be spontaneous as well because of um, basically weakening in the tissue wall that allows for air to escape, a few different things, and also tall, skinny males are most dominantly going to be in that spontaneous pneumothorax category of patients, but the majority of pneumothoraxes are created due to some sort of blunt, or sometimes the more obvious one is the, uh, the penetrating trauma that can cause a pneumothorax as well. And so let's talk more about the blunt, pneumo, uh, blunt causes of pneumothorax because those ones are gonna be the less obvious because you're not gonna be thinking about a myocardial infarction if you have an obvious um, trauma or penetrating trauma. That's just not what you're gonna be thinking about. But let's say this is a blunt trauma. So obviously your history is gonna give you the best indication that this potentially could be a tension pneumothorax or pneumothorax. But other things too, like the pain description is more pleuretic again. Okay, pleuretic. And that's another good indicator that we have some sort of damage to the lung tissue as opposed to the mediastinal kind of actual cardiac tissue there. So when it comes to that, those are the big things you're gonna be looking for and also absent breath sounds. Okay, absent breath sounds on the affected area. That's probably gonna be your biggest indicator of a pneumothorax is the decrease of breath sounds in the affected area. Um, that's a good indicator that you have a pneumothorax as opposed to any type of pathology. So look for that, get a good assessment, and you'll find yourself in a good position to identify these different pathologies that can lead to death. So there you have it. There's the five deadly cardiac emergencies or chest pain emergencies that we can see other than myocardial infarctions. Now, as you can see, the key here is to making sure that you're looking for those subtle differences in the differentiation between those chest pain emergencies, and that will allow us to have early recognition for our patients and give them the best outcomes possible. Make sure you check out the article on the GEMS magazine about the five deadly causes of chest pain. It gives a very deep understanding of the things that you can look for, different history patterns, in order to give you the best chances of having a good differential and an accurate differential and keeping your index of suspicion high. We'll see you next time.